Well, as I said during my confirmation hearing, uh, to me being Secretary of Veterans Affairs is the ultimate and a high calling uh, to care for the veterans uh, who have served this country. Uh, in a sense, the 1% who have worked and defended the 100% uh, to be in a leadership position to be able to make a difference, to accomplish our mission to serve them is the ultimate and a high calling. It's uh, in many ways the culmination of my life. It's uh, after 33 years of Procter and Gamble and nine years in the military, four years at West Point, five years as an officer in the Army. Um, it's the opportunity to take everything I've learned in all the countries of the world I've lived in and apply it uh, here to help the U.S. government, to help America's veterans. Uh, so it's a great capstone to whatever career or life I've had to date. I think the, the, the fact that uh, four years at West Point, five years in the military, primarily in the 2nd Airborne Division as an Airborne Ranger Infantry Officer, uh, gives me empathy for the customers, the veterans that we're trying to serve. Um, while I never did serve in combat, uh, my service did involve uh, going to the Arctic Circle, going to Jungle Warfare School in Panama, uh, jumping all these different places, uh, injuries from those jumps, and so I hope it, I hope it gives me empathy for the people that I'm, that I'm trying to serve, and hopefully some credibility with that population that, that I've at least been part of the way there uh, during my time. Well, I think about the soldiers I served with every single day. And I thought about that before I was here at, uh, at the Veterans Affairs Department. I thought about that when I was at Procter & Gamble. Um, when you go through these cathartic experiences together, um, it changes your life. And one of the things I used to teach the leaders of Procter & Gamble is I, I would say, I can teach you all the behaviors which, when observed from afar, somebody would label them as leadership. The one behavior, the one need I can't teach you as a leader necessarily is the need to love the people you work with. One of the things you learn in the military, like no other place, because of the in extremist situations you're in, is to love the people you're working with. I think back to Sergeant Schrader, who uh, was with me in the Arctic, and because of the cold weather, uh, one of our 4.2 inch mortar tubes blew up and a piece of the base cap uh, hit him in the abdomen. Uh, we had to medevac him out. I think about uh, PFC Light, who was my driver and radio telephone operator in the 82nd Airborne Division and the number of jumps we would go on together. Um, the bonds that you, that you form um, just last a lifetime. I think about Sergeant Cuff, who was a, uh, a squad leader. I think about Sergeant Turner, who ran the uh, fire direction center for our 4.2 inch mortar platoon. I, I, I remember the day that I jumped in uh, to a drop zone ASIC in Airborne Division uh, at Fort Bragg and, and my battalion commander, Dave Harris, came and picked me up on the drop zone in a Jeep. He said, throw your parachute in a Jeep. We went to a firing range. We got to the firing range. He fired the platoon leader who was running the 4.2 inch mortar platoon. We had just finished last in the division on our readiness test. And he said, Lieutenant McDonald, a year from now, I want this platoon to be one of the best in the division. Um, but these are, these are life-changing life experiences. <laughs> and uh, I'm happy to report that a year, a year later, we were the second best in the division. Unfortunately, we missed first best by a little bit. Well, I, I, I joke with folks that uh, I was named Bob when I was born. Uh, I'm Bob now as secretary, and I'll be Bob after I'm done being secretary. But while that sounds um, more of a joke or a little bit trite, there's really a serious purpose behind it. I think one of the things that we've got to do as an organization is we've got to get better communications from the top to the bottom of the organization. We've got to engage everyone 
uh, in the organization, whether they're uh, union member employees, GS employees, SES employees, Title 38 employees, everybody's on the same team, everybody's got the same dream. And we've got to work together like a family. We've got to be able to tell each other when things are going wrong and when things are going right. We have to be able to admit ourselves when things are going wrong and not have a fear of reprisal or some other thing. Um, I want everybody to be a whistleblower. I don't think you need to fit the legal definition of a whistleblower, but I want everybody every day to feel responsibility for improving the way we serve veterans. We should look at everything we do from the lens of the veteran and if, 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 if something's not going right, we should change it. Um, I often tell employees of uh, Veterans Affairs that uh, my organization model is different than others. Uh, typically an organization model is thought to be hierarchical, it's, it's thought to be a pyramid and typically the, the CEO or the secretary in this case would be on top and the lower ranking employees would be the ones that interface with the veteran. Well, in a service organization like ours, where we're serving veterans every single day, that's our only reason for being, we really should invert that pyramid. And the pyramid should be inverted where the broad part is at the top and the apex is at the bottom. And the person at the bottom is me, the secretary, trying to help those people who are facing the veteran. So it's, it's the people facing the veteran every single day providing service to those veterans that um, are the most critically important people in the organization. And that's why I think being on a first name basis makes us more like family, gives us empathy for that veteran, and uh, will allow us to work together with one dream uh, as one team and one family. At the, at the Procter & Gamble company, we're about an $84 billion company. We operate in about 200 countries around the world. And uh, every day, somewhere in the world, uh, about 5 billion people use at least one Procter & Gamble product. Now, obviously, we'd like, we'd like it to be more. Um, but there's an immense, immense laser-like focus on the customer, uh, every single customer. If you go around the Procter & Gamble headquarters around the world, you'll see nothing on the walls but pictures of consumers using our products. We revere those consumers, we focus on what they need, and we work hard to meet their needs. Uh, tremendous empathy. The purpose of the company is to improve the lives of the world's consumers. And we like to say that the consumer is boss. That's who we serve. Well, the analogy is, is very clear here at Veterans Affairs. Our boss is the veteran. Our customer is the veteran. We should look at everything we do through the lens of that veteran and make sure we're doing everything we can to help that veteran and do nothing more. In other words, strip out all the unnecessary work that we're doing that doesn't focus on helping the veteran. Um, it's, it's, it's a tremendous calling to be able to make a difference in the life of another person. Um, and to be able to do that with a veteran, I think, is even in a higher calling because of what they've done for all of us. So that laser-like focus on customer satisfaction, on, on uh, providing the veteran the care they need, is, uh, is really what's critically important from my experience. I think the, the reason some employees uh, fail to live up to our I care values um, is that oftentimes in large organizations, the measures within the organization, the inertia within the organization, tends to blind people from the ultimate goal of the organization. Here at Veterans Affairs, our ultimate goal is to serve the veteran. That's the only reason we exist. But there are times where uh, a metric may be set like 14 days and that metric becomes an outcome rather than a means to an outcome. The outcome has got to be quality care for veterans in a timely way. That's got to be the outcome. 14 days was supposed to be a means to that outcome, but it ended up being coming an outcome. Um, that's not unusual in large organizations. Uh, sometimes uh, large organizations take on a life of their own and they forget about their customer. Uh, it happened at the Procter & Gamble company around 1999. We recommitted ourselves to the consumer's boss. It's happened here. 
Uh, that's why I've asked everyone to recommit themselves to our mission of caring for the veteran and to our values of eye care. It's time to renew that and we should renew that every year so that we, this doesn't happen again. One of the things I, I found curious when I first showed up at uh, VA was I thought everybody's first name was acting or interim. I wasn't sure if I had joined a Veterans Affairs Department or if I had joined a Shakespearean acting troupe since everybody was named acting. Um, obviously one of the things we've got to do is we've got to get the right leaders in place and we've got to do that very quickly. And I'm spending uh, a good majority of my time right now on identifying those leaders and doing what's necessary to get the background checks done and so forth to get people in place. Uh, virtually half of our leadership team is, uh, is acting or interim. Um, we've got to get the right leaders in place and we're working very hard on that. The other thing we're doing is we're trying to get any personnel action we have to take uh, disciplinary uh, done very quickly because it's best to get that done, get us behind us, get the right people in place. My friend Jim Collins who writes business books, uh, good to great, built to last, says you gotta get the right people on the bus and get them, on the right, get them in the right seats on the bus. That's always job one of a leader. It always takes longer than you want it to take, uh, but that's what we're really focused on right now. The only way to change a veteran's mind and to regain the trust that we may have lost is really to do it one veteran at a time and one VA employee at a time. It reminds me of the story of the, um, of the two men on the beach uh, and the beach is loaded with uh, starfish who are stranded as the tide recede, reset, receded. And um, this old man is walking around the beach picking up starfish and throwing them back in the water so they could live. And the young man says to the old man, you know, why are you doing this? You can't possibly make a difference for all these starfish. We have nine million veterans who are um, part of the, the Veterans Affairs uh, activity. How do I get to all nine million at one time? And the old man said, well, it, it may not make a difference. I may not be able to throw all of them back in the sea, but it does make a difference to this one as he throws it back in the sea. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to make a difference to every single veteran we interface with, one at a time, not necessarily worrying about the big picture of trust, but earning it back one by one by one by one. It's all of our responsibilities, and I hope all of the 340,000 employees of Veterans Affairs will work hard to do that for the nine million veterans that we're now serving. Accountability is, is, is really about responsibility. It's about doing the right thing every single day. Um, I remember my first day at West Point um, as a new cadet, even before you become a cadet, you're thought to be the lowest form of life on earth. And, uh, and as that lowest form of life on earth, to any situation, you're only allowed four answers. Those four answers uh, are yes sir, no sir, sir I do not understand, and no excuse sir. No excuse is, is perhaps the most powerful answer in the world. Implicit in that is no excuse and it won't happen again, uh, which is a very important part of it. But it shows that you take responsibility. You take responsibility for the action and you will correct it and make sure it doesn't happen again. Once you do that, the debate is over. And I think in, in our particular case, um, we, we need to say no excuse more often. We need to take responsibility and we need to fix uh, what went wrong and make sure it doesn't happen again. That's an important part of a learning organization. Organizations do make mistakes. It's going to happen. Do we have a culture where people can stand up, admit they made a mistake without fear of of some kind of retribution and then make sure everybody in the organization learns from that mistake. Well, the, the need to regain the trust of employees is as important as regaining the trust of the public. So one of the reasons I've been going out, um, Phoenix, Las Vegas, Reno, Memphis, uh, Philadelphia tomorrow, um, North Carolina, Durham, North Carolina, 
uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. The reason I've been going out to meet with employees is to listen to their concerns, but also to reinforce in their mind that we do serve a high calling, that we know that the majority of employees have not violated our eye care values or our mission, and to hopefully inspire them um, that I appreciate what they're doing, and, uh, and so do the myriad of veterans who may not be public in the newspaper and the press, but tell them on a daily basis. I've met with so many veterans in so many different facilities, and I have to tell you, the vast majority of them are thrilled with the care they get. They love the caregivers uh, at the VA, and they're thankful for what we do. So going out uh, and meeting with people, trying to uh, thank them for what they're doing and inspiring them as part of regaining uh, the employee trust. Look at we're, we're going to win. Everybody wants to be on a winning team. Uh, every employee I've talked to wants to be on a winning team. This is a winning team. Uh, we had a little bit of a setback, but think of that as an inning or a quarter of the game, and we're going to win the game. And uh, my job is to help employees realize that, to give them the leadership, to give them the strategies, give them the systems and the culture, the high performance organization to be able to do that. And uh, I think we're well on our way. Well, uh, the fact that eye care already existed and a sound strategic plan already existed is what makes me confident that we can get this thing turned around quickly and headed in the right direction. When I was preparing for my Senate confirmation hearings, I was doing my due diligence on the organization. Uh, while we have doctors that diagnose patients, uh, as a leader of large organizations over many decades, uh, I tend to be a doctor of organizational science, I guess. So I used the model I used for high performance organization to understand what was going wrong. So I studied our leadership, I studied our strategies, I studied our systems, I studied our culture, I studied our purpose, values, and principles. And what I discovered was we had a great mission and it was, it was all around the organization. We had great values and we had a very sound strategic plan. It needs renewed, but it's a very sound strategic plan. And what befuddled me was how did we have those things, yet something went wrong. So um, when I saw those and I was, I was testifying in front of the Senate, I actually held up the, the strategic plan with the eye care and, the, and, and so forth. And I said, this is very sound. We just need to implement it. The issue was it was developed in the right way. Employees all over the country were involved in developing eye care and the strategic plan. But once we developed it, we didn't deploy it. What do I mean by that? What I mean is cascading levels of the organization do not have strategies or action plans that tie back to that strategic plan. Every employee doesn't have an action plan in their personnel review that ties back to that strategic action plan. So what we're going to be doing is renewing that strategic plan and then going in and making sure we deploy it throughout the organization by, la by level, by layer, until we get to the lowest level employee, the one on top of the pyramid, who um, has an action plan that ties back to a strategic plan. It's great to have a, an inspiring mission, but people have to have line of sight from their behavior every single day back to that mission. What happened in our organization is we have a lot of behavior every single day where the employee says, I don't understand why I'm doing this because it has nothing to do with serving veterans. We've got to get rid of that stuff and focus only on serving the veterans. I think that the ultimate communication I'd like to give to all veterans and all employees is we have the highest and most inspiring mission we could possibly have. We care for veterans. We do it in the right way. And, uh, and we're going to be back. We're going to be back for those who have um, suffered um, uh, inappropriate care or for those employees who have suffered retaliation uh, as they've tried to point out things that are going wrong. Uh, I apologize for that and uh, we're going to turn this thing around 
And we're going to get to a point where every veteran in this country and every employee are proud of the Veterans Affairs Department. It's going to happen quickly, um, but we're going to be back.